Sarika Kulis Suzuki grew up connected to nature and activism. She stepped out from her father's enormous environmental shadow to pursue her own passions for conservation and biodiversity. She studied marine biology at the University of California, Berkeley, and has a master's in science with the Fisheries Center at UBC. Recently, Sarika collaborated with award-winning undersea photographer David Hall and wrote the foreword to his stunning photographic book, Beneath Cold Seas. It is my pleasure to welcome Sarika Kulis Suzuki to Studio 4 to tell us more. Dare I welcome you back home or are you living here? Well, I'm actually doing my field work here in BC, but I go to school in England right now. Mm. Yeah. Well, so. you have to stop and see Ross Lovegrove. I and know, <laughs> I know, I definitely do. I really enjoyed his interview before this. Mm -hmm. so. Because it's about uh, nature, inspiring art, mm -hmm. it's about connection, and it's about conservation. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, what, the reason I'm involved in this book I had no idea who David Hall was, but he approached me to be involved and write the introduction. And I took one look at these amazing mm. photos, which you've seen, and I yes. just was floored. I mean, I've been diving for many years, and I have never seen some of the images that he has in his book. He is phenomenal. He is. He period. Is. Uh, I can't imagine, and I know you couldn't imagine, taking a picture under the sea until you went with him to say, right. gee, you can't go to Starbucks, <laughs> you know, when you're under the ocean, yeah. or you can't grab a coffee, mm -hmm. you just have to wait and wait and wait. Exactly, and that was one of the things. I, The first time I met him, actually, we were doing a dive together, and we were looking for this adorable fish. It's called the Pacific Spiny Lump Sucker. It's the cutest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> it's the size of a grape, mm -hmm. and it, it kind of goes around like this, it swims, it's really slow. Anyway, so we were in search of this Pacific Spiny Lump Sucker, and we go into the ocean and he is just covered in gear, like from head to toe, I could basically not even see him anymore. And we go into the ocean and we drop down and we sit there on the bottom of the ocean floor and I'm getting colder and colder and he has his big camera and he's filming and he's adjusting his lens and his light and forever, right? And, mm -hmm. and for me, I'm like, well, this is a little bit boring. But at the end of the dive, he comes back and he has these incredible photos that you could just never normally get if you were just swimming alone, right? Well, as I told you in the green room, I'm not a water baby. I doubt I will ever see these magnificent mm -hmm. uh, fish and even a coral reef. Right. frankly. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the purpose of it all mm -hmm. is to say, I think, for you especially, we, we have an abundant ecosystem mm -hmm. under the waves. Uh, we have an endangered ecosystem yeah. under the waves. Absolutely. And I think what you say, most of us will never be able to go under the waves and see mm -hmm. this amazing ecosystem. Um, and I think for people who are from the West Coast, we really need to understand what we have. Uh, this, a couple of years ago, I was in Bristol in the UK. I was visit visiting the BBC uh, Natural History Unit. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting down for lunch, and a producer came and sat next to me. And we just started talking. He was totally uninterested in what I had to say until he found out where I was from. And then his eyes lit up, and he kind of pounced on me and started peppering me with questions. And he was like, oh, you're from the West Coast. Is it true you guys have salmon and killer whales and eagles and herring and all these things, right? And bears, and it just went on and on. And, and I, I started becoming excited and I said, yeah, yeah. And I became more and more proud. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of struck me, you know, he wanted to come to Canada and film our coast because they're so rich and mm -hmm. so abundant. Mm -hmm. And it took somebody from the UK to remind me what we had. But then at the same time, I realized, you know, at one point, the areas surrounding his place, the UK, were rich and abundant. And it just kind of reminded me that things are not as they used to be. And mm -hmm. he had to come to Canada to see that type of abundance. Uh, I think it's called, and maybe you coined this, a shifting baseline syndrome. Oh, I can't take credit for that. That okay. is um, Daniel Pauly, who's at the University of British Columbia. He was my supervisor for my master's. Mm. But that's exactly right. And shifting baseline syndrome, as he calls it, is what happens, um, the loss of knowledge from one generation to the next. So the example that I use is when my dad was young and he went out to catch rockfish, a big rockfish would be this big. Mm -hmm. And today when I go out, a big rockfish would be no, this big mm -hmm. if I even catch one at all. So for me, that's normal. And what happens is a slow, kind of a gradual acceptance of an unnatural state. So if we don't know what used to be, if we don't know how rich our oceans used to be, how are we ever mm -hmm. going to know what type of conservation measures to put in place mm -hmm. or what we should have in yes. the ocean? I, I live on a, a stream, a creek, mm -hmm. and 20 years ago, kids were catching salmon out of the creek. There you go. Uh, there's 
very little life in that creek now. Wow. The odd raccoon. Okay, that's <laughs> you different. Know, yeah. That's about it, but you certainly couldn't eat out of the creek. Wouldn't huh. happen. Uh, you grew up uh, spending a lot of time on Quadra Island. I did, yeah. The magnificent very Quadra. Mm -hmm. Very lucky. But tell me about the time the uh, Japanese family came to visit you. Oh, man. Yeah, that was something. Um, I was young. I was a little kid. And my dad had some family friends that he wanted to bring. They're from Japan. They're from Tokyo. And they had two daughters. So it was a man, woman, and their two daughters. And my sister and I, you know, were always scrambling along the rocks and in the ocean, in and out all day long. And we wanted to show these kids, you know, what Quadra had to offer. We wanted to go outside. And they were so terrified of going outside. You know, our property is right on the water. Mm -hmm. um, that they never left the house. And what they were really terrified about was wind. When the kids, the first time they went outside, they felt something on their face. They said, it's too scary. I don't know what that is. And it was wind. And the scary thing about that is you realize that these kids had grown up entirely mm -hmm. inside. inside. And that kind of disconnect, which was, mm -hmm. you know, in a child, I'd never seen something that striking before. It was really, sure. really sad. Uh, and afraid of the wind, and it certainly would be afraid of a little crab. There you I go. would think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like when I was a little girl, I collected tadpoles. I don't know if that was politically correct. Why but you, not? You, You're discovering nature. You collect yeah. tadpoles mm -hmm. and you bring it home, put it in the big wash tub in the, yeah. you know, yeah. with a rock and some, some uh, lettuce or something, yeah. and hope that they grow into frogs. And they did. Wow. It was like amazing. Holy. One day there was a little frog. <laughs> you know, a little see-through frog, and you're thrilled out of your mind. You yeah. really are. So uh, back to uh, David Hall and you <laughs> beneath cold seas. Yeah. Uh, that red Irish Lord Sculpin. Mm -hmm. Tell me about him, her, it. Well, I just love the photos that have the red Irish Lord in it because there's one photo uh, in particular that shows the color. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I mean, normally when we think of colorful ocean ecosystems, well, I think of a coral reef, right? Like right. more uh, warmer waters. Mm -hmm. But this is taken in the cold waters of the North Pacific. Right. And you just, amazing. You know, that last photograph, there's so much diversity. There's red, there's sponges, um, there's worms, there's mollusks, there's seaweeds, there's fish, you know, in a small area of ocean. And that's, that's just one photo. So mm -hmm. you can just imagine the richness we have in our seas. Well, the colors. I know. The colors are really extraordinary. Uh, extraordinary. Even barnacles. Yeah. You right? know? Yeah. Because I think barnacle, kind of gray, dark, what do I know? The yeah. gooseneck barnacles, is that that yeah, one? Yeah, the gooseneck barnacles. That one. Yeah. Look. Aren't those striking? Mm. And that's what David Hall does so magnificently, is he takes images that we wouldn't normally look at or see, and he makes them so, inc you know, amazing for right. us. And it kind of brings us into the ocean and gives us that sense of wonder that I think we need to be able to reconnect well, with Well, so it. much of it is surreal. Really, yeah, I know. It? It's it's like art. Mm -hmm, Some very look like much. like pictures, not even photographs. Even that stubby squid. The stubby squid. Yeah, you know a lot about <laughs> this. I <laughs> don't. Well, I read the book on the weekend because it was so beautiful. I've just never seen anything I like know, it. I know. I hadn't either. And you know, he's from New York, and he came. Mm -hmm. He took him 15 years to put this together. So it, That's it a long takes time. a lot of patience. A lot of patience. Yeah. And uh, Queen Charlotte Strait. Where is it all over? Is it? Where so was he, he? Well, he says that this sea life can be found up and down the North Pacific coast, which generally people describe as Northern California all the way up to Alaska. Right. But all these images were taken within BC. Uh, again, rich, abundant, mm -hmm. but only, I think I've got this right. Your dad will call me if I don't have this <laughs> right. 1% of the global oceans are protected, 1%? It's uh, really, really dire. And when we're talking about protection, like what does protection really mean? Mm -hmm. um, real no-take areas, which means you can't take anything away. You really have to leave that area pristine. That's even less than 1%. Sure, and Sam on our coast, we're not doing well. Well, either. Simon Jackson was just here, who is my pal. And oh, I've yeah. been a friend of the bear for so long. And uh, as you know, they want to uh, put an oil tanker up by Princess Royal or yeah, through yeah, through the Douglas waters. Channel. and. Mm -hmm. We don't want that to happen. Exactly, exactly. And on it goes. But if you think about what, how fish and an octopus is disturbed just by the mere fact that something's going through the waters, and I don't mean we yeah. no, can't you're... trade and have commerce and move oil. We yeah. have to. But uh, your research yeah. 
on sound? Is it on noise or sound? Yeah, no, exactly. I'm looking at the effect of human sound on fish. So over the last decade, we've looked at, re or people have done research on cetaceans, so marine mammals like whales and dolphins, and mm -hmm. we know that they need sound to be able to communicate. But we haven't really looked at other animals in the sea, and I'm really curious, well, does a fish get it, um, affected? For instance, when a super tanker goes by and it emits all this noise, what happens to the fish and the animals underneath? Mm -hmm. And what I found, there is a species of fish, you won't believe me, but it sings so loudly that you can hear it outside of the ocean. It sings. It sings. It emits this low hum. Mm. And together with hundreds and hundreds of these fish, you can hear them outside of the, really? of the water. And I just discovered this. I've been going to Quadra for 25 years. And for the first time, I have heard them. So there is so much wonder still to be seen from these seas and, and heard, I guess. But yeah. I, I walked out onto the dock at 1 AM, and I heard this noise. And I'm what is that? It sounded like a generator, right? And it's only because I was studying this fish that I knew that it was the plain fin midshipman. So really? it's a, it's a Easy really Easy for you thing. to say. Yeah. The plain, what is it again? Plain fin midshipman. Uh-huh. It's basically, it looks like a big sculpin with kind of like an underbite and big eyes. Mm -hmm. I think it's adorable, but I, I'd never seen it until I was actually looking for it. Right, you would. I would, I, I would. Adorable, great. <laughs> but but so important, to, uh, the impact of noise on fish, of noise on humans, we study that all the Absolutely, time. Yeah. A sense of smell in a, in a fish. I, I read somewhere where the returning sockeye female right. actually uses a sense of smell it's unbelievable. I'm so not a marine biologist. No, no, I, no. But the, I mean, the, the point is we don't know how these animals can migrate oh. all around and come back to the very stream that they, they were started. born. started. I know. Well, it's, we couldn't do that. We couldn't. You know, without a map. Yeah, right? and even I, then. If they you know, turned us loose at maybe, four years maybe old. Maybe GPS, that would be okay. <laughs> Maybe. No, but it's so true when you yeah. think of how magnificent that is and the colors. I've been to the Adams River. You have. Yes. What an experience. I've never seen anything like it. Were you there last year when the huge. No, I was there back? several years ago. Okay, yeah. It was like. Out of this world, hey? I know, the dead swimming, but the amazing dead. <laughs> you know? And it sustains life. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you heard uh, about 10 years ago, they came up with a study that showed salmon don't only nourish other animals in the ocean, like sea lions and whales, but they, in fact, nourish the surrounding ecosystem as well. Yes. They feed trees. So what happens is salmon goes out um, into the marine ocean, comes back through the stream, dies, as you saw in the Adams right. River. Bears come, take their carcasses, eat them in the forest, mm -hmm. doesn't eat the whole thing. It decomposes into the soil, and those nutrients are taken up into the trees and the shrubs and the right. mosses that surround those streams. Well, Ian McAllister was telling me that the swimming wolves uh, yeah. eat the salmon and pee in the woods. Oh. And even that will make a cedar grow taller. Really? Now, he may have been joking. Better <laughs> check with Dad. <laughs> Not sure. How nice Maybe to I meet just, you. Really good to and meet you. And you'll be Benny. speaking and presenting uh, BC Marine Life with you, Beneath <laughs> Cold Seas, at the uh, uh, Alice McKay Room, Vancouver Public Library on Thursday. Yes, that's 7 right. 7 p.m. with this in hand. Yes. And David slides. Hall won't be there. He won't. I wish he would come to town. Can we convince him? Uh, we should. I think he's coming um, in October to Great. do a dive, so maybe you'll meet him then. Great, let's do that. Okay. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, Sarika Kala Suzuki Beneath Cold Seas, the Underwater Wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, a collaboration with David Hall.